This is an introduction to the rotatable covered cavity kiln called sometimes spelled out R-O-C-C, sometimes I'll say rock kiln. And we're dealing with medium sized production of pyrolytic bio biochar and thermal energy. Uh, topics to be covered in here, give you a, a little look ahead. Uh, pyrolysis for profit and for other worthy objectives. Other worthy objectives certainly include scientific investigation and uh, uh, why you are here. There are certain things that you're trying to do and we need to, I need to relate and I want this all to relate to what your interests are. There is a gap in the middle size range of pyrolyzer technologies. I'm going to go through those, but I'm not trying to present an exhaustive list and certainly not everything is, is included there. And we'll focus then on flame cap pyrolysis with two types, the open top, which is the best known, and then the covered cavity kiln. Uh, there are deficiencies in those uh, earliest units with that, discuss those, and then deal with the major components of the rock kiln and the issue that it's rotatable. Have some examples of sizes of the kilns and what you can expect. Business issues of patents, prices, opportunities, and I want this, and hopefully in the questions, it will be how you define them. And then the uh, ROCC kiln for climate intervention strategies and the fact that it is available for uh, everywhere here. There are numerous profit centers for pyrolytic char making, okay? The pyrolytic devices technologies, they're in the center there, but they can produce charcoal products, thermal energy, biomass disposal, and other benefits. Now, we want to get combinations of these. If we're going to want to have uh, lots of biochar production, it's very nice if we're also able to get some financial gain in terms of the thermal energy from it, or simply clearing away to avoid landfills or for fire protection. Look, and the other one, the other benefits, uh, chemical derivatives, carbon offsets, and climate benefits, many of them are uh, intangible, or maybe as society goes along, they will become part of the financial structure with it. This is simply a second view of the same type of slide with a few more words and details in it, and that will remain inside the uh, presentation so that when people go back and look at it, they can study one or the other. Pyrolytic technologies of dry biomass, there's basically three types, the without oxygen, with limited oxygen, and with much oxygen. Uh, without oxygen, the retorts, the laboratory scale, the test tubes and things like that, the atom retort, rotary kiln. With limited oxygen, we have gasifiers of various types with flaming pyrolysis. The, I call it glowing pyrolysis of t -LUDs, where I've done most of my work on pyrolysis. And then the flame cap technology, which I refer to as cavity kilns of two types, the open top and the covered top. Open top with pit, trench, trough, pyramid, cone, contiki, et cetera. And then with much oxygen, but we're still getting charcoal. If you have a forest fire, there is a lot of charcoal out there on the outsides of those trees and things. So there's, uh, it, it does make charcoal that way, but it's not certainly not a scarcity of, of oxygen. Cools down too fast. Kelpie Kilson has worked a lot with the uh, conservation burn, and then we have the air curtain machines, industrial furnaces, and incinerators. We'll take a look at some of those as we go along here. I've classified the bi biochar production techniques by orders of magnitude. The IBI used similar re way here, but they did not have each order of magnitude with its own separate name. So under a kilo, that's something in the laboratory. The micro, the small is from, the micro is from one to 10, small 10 to 100 kgs, midi 100 to a ton, and then we've got the medium and then the large ones and then the over 100 tons. And this is defined as the input of biomass in 10 hours of operation. Some of the devices become 24 uh, hours a day operations, but most things, people go home at night and they're not trying to run these things at three o'clock in the morning. 
Uh, the objectives of each one of those, the laboratories are testing, et cetera. The micro is for the cooking. Uh, the, uh, the small and the midi are for making biochar from, from what, all that I can see. The medium, the objectives aren't really clear because we lack uh, devices in that size. On the large size, it's for charcoal or for char, for chemical products, for power outputs with it, industrial uh, combined heat and power. Char is sort of secondary. It's there. It has an extra value. They're trying to make more char as it goes along. On the small size here, these are pictures of the uh, of tea lud stoves. Uh, the natural draft one is on the right, and on the left is the new, soon to be coming out uh, fab stove from South Africa. Uh, very, this will be a whole separate presentation at some other time about what we can do for char making with uh, the micro gasification system. At the small size range and the, and the midi, we have T-LUD barrels, 55 gallon uh, drums. Uh, uh, Michael Schaefer in Thailand, Warm Heart Foundation, has had several hundred of the drums working at one time or for the community. You get many, many, lots of things done that way if everything works out right. Uh, but the drum is about as big as it goes with the exception of the, the work that's in uh, Cambodia, which is some special uh, equipment and special, uh, much larger uh, system. The uh, MIDI size, including probably the retorts, the atom retort, um, without that, without the oxygen present. The flame cap is also in the uh, small and MIDI size. The pit kiln, the uh, contiki, the troughs, the trenches, the pyramids, uh, they're all uh, depressions or cavities where oxygen is not able to access the charcoal that is falling down into the bottom of those areas. These are the open cavity kilns. Closed or covered, not closed, but covered cavity kilns. I've worked on, and there have probably only been about eight of these ever made. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a, a learning experience, but I've been working on it since uh, 2014. Uh, the, the part of, okay. The, uh, medium size, I'm saying it's basically missing. If people are able to suggest things which will take in one ton to 10 tons in a 10 hour day, uh, we should need to see what they are. Uh, basically, they tend to have fairly high prices, more sophisticated equipment, things like that. Uh, we need something which is affordable. The major gap, which I hope to be have filled with the variations of the uh, ROCC or rock kilns. The large size is the, um, on the far left, the industrial furnaces. These are large buildings. We're talking millions of dollars of, of equipment and the output and uh, business arrangements. Rotary kilns are, are, are available. And also then the air curtain, uh, which is a, um, uh, available from several different types, but they don't produce that much biochar. Many of these things, they're trying to get other derivatives, they're trying to get the heat from it, and biochar is a nice extra if possible. On the evolution of the rock kiln, first of all, it is flame cap technology, also known as flame curtains. The, the uh, is accomplished in cavities with closed bottoms. The classic flame cap occurs when there's an open top on it, the, the picture on the left, diagram on the left. And then we have the covered cavity kilns like the 4C kiln, clean controlled covered cavity kiln, where we got the four Cs. With that, and the covered units have increased enclosure, but they, are, they were not, they're not rotatable. A list of the various characteristics, sharing them in between in there, uh, but you can see the picture on the on the right, which uh, I have created, and it's available if anybody wants to copy it and put it into drawings and things. It's a representation uh, trying to be somewhat on parallel with the uh, diagram to the left, showing that at the bottom of the chamber is where the charcoal is accumulating. We have a layer in there where pyrolysis is occurring from the heat 
that is coming down onto the biomass from the combustion of the gases which are above it, above that biomass. And then because the covered unit is in, uh, semi-enclosed, it is going, it is able to direct the gases emissions up the chimney, the heat up the chimney, and we hope to be able to, to utilize that heat better. It is, uh, and also be cleaner and have the ability to uh, measure emissions and things which are inside. <laughs> this is a, uh, just another extra one. It's giving the same diagram side by side on a full size screen so people can look at and read them more, uh, read it more easily. There are deficiencies in the static or non-rotatable uh, cavity kiln. In general, fuel input is gradual and it requires attention of the user. Uh, it is not something which is easily automated, uh, certainly not without substantial cost. There is possible incomplete charring if some of the biomass fuel becomes buried. This is why the fuel input must be gradual, must be monitored. And this becomes a problem because you can end up with parts of actually raw fuel or torrified fuel um, inside that um, uh, static uh, non-movable cavity kiln. Uh, there's lots of pictures, people mixing it, trying to poke it with sticks and trying to get some kind of, of uh, uh, exposure for the biomass that might be getting buried. <clears throat> Lack of control of air flows. It does not readily scale up to much larger sizes. Uh, um, the, uh, nobody, I don't think, has proposed a, a four meter diameter um, contiki or other open top cavity kiln. Uh, one exception, though, is Kelpie Wilson's the Turtle, which is a flippable half cylinder. Um, not, uh, it's done, it's available, that type of thing to look, consider. And also it can become too hot for the operator to approach without equipment. As the units get larger, the radiant heat is immense and, uh, um, and, and a, a limitation on the sizes that you can do with the static kiln, cavity kiln. And then extinguishing and extracting the hot charcoal becomes difficult as size increases. The solutions included in the rock kiln, we have tumbling of the biomass. This is when the kiln is rotated when needed. It is not a rotary kiln, which tends to, those types are rotating all the time, or they have internal parts which are rotating and augers and things. This kiln is only rotated on occasion. That's why it's rotatable rather than rotating. Let gravity do the work. It has one doorway or portal in it for, in through which the air and fuel enter and then the emissions and char come out through that one same opening. You'll see pictures in just a minute. And that opening has some different positions which I also explain in, in a moment. The, uh, uh, it can have a movable grate or prongs that can, cover, that can come over this uh, portal and the uh, and you could even have a, a doorway in special cases and you can get the full 360-degree rotation without emptying everything out. Two forms of fuel loading, one by a horizontal shelf and the other from a vertical drop to be explained also. And the uh, unloading is downward onto a slide or into a container. You let gravity do the work. Uh, no handling, no shoveling in this until it's actually outside of the kiln then you can mechanize it, you can do other things with it. Uh, chimneys, multiple, can, are separate from the kiln itself. Uh, the kiln rotates, the chimneys do not. The chimneys are on a detached hood, which is available. And the detachable hood is credited to, to Gary Gilmore, who's attending this uh, webinar, I noticed, uh, in Pennsylvania. The, he is listed as the co-inventor with me on the patent application. So we always should be thanking Gary for what he has done for us. The, uh, uh, okay, and finally, we, we can use standardized industrial materials like corrugated steel pipe. Now we'll see some pictures here in a second. Steel pipe, we're going to scale from two foot diameters up to six, over 16 foot diameters. 
uh, and they can be at appropriate length. This is additional benefits of this technology. It can be portable or stationary. Uh, additional sensors, air control, directional controls of emitted gases and heat, and operators are less exposed to the direct fire and the radiant heat. These are additional benefits. And the um, rotatable cover, this is fuel delivery is faster and more plentiful, and it does not matter that some of it gets buried inside because we have the ability to, to mix it. And also the fuel entry can be automated. Uh, we get more complete charring uh, from this because of our ability to mix inside of the, uh, uh, pyro of the pyrolyzer, um, better control of air flows. We are, I say, nearly continuous operations because there's a short break as we can take out uh, most of, but still leave embers and, and, uh, and ignition material inside the operation. And then also doing batch operations, so it's something that you, you can close down at the end of the day. You don't have to have uh, expensive equipment that you really must run 24 hours a day. Low cost, we want low maintenance, we want low labor requirements. Scale up to the larger sizes, and also to facilitate the extracting and extinguishing of the hot charcoal. We're going to deal now, we we're dealing with the sizes of these units that back there and the midi, medium, and large sizes, uh, three orders of magnitude into there. Uh, the different ROC kilns span the sizes from midi to large. Mostly it's in the uh, medium size range, which is the one to 10 tons. If it's 10 tons in a 10 hour period, you're putting in like half a cord of wood every hour into a device and is able to continue operating. And obviously, I mean, if you wanted to run it 20, 20 hours or 24 hours, you'd get larger quantities. Here's some pictures now. At the mini size, which is the, the, uh, like over 100 kg a day, uh, these, these are mainly in um, 55 gallon or 200 liter barrels, the ones on the uh, left and there. The, the pictures on the right hand side, uh, there's two pictures there. That is a three, a, a three foot diameter barrel. And that is with Manish Kumar in um, uh, Odessa, India. And he is also on our, uh, attending our site today. So maybe he'll have some questions on it. All of us have problems with the lockdown. And uh, so this has been a big setback for us. But the, um, I'd like to point out that the that the uh, the unit in the bottom two on the left side that is built in was in Kenya, and uh, it was built in 24 hours by uh, a welding shop, a welding shop which works out on the street and uh, um, brings its stuff in at night to to lock it away. And this is not the high tech in order to get the things built. The upper left picture is literally an operational unit in my backyard in a residential area in uh, central Illinois. Uh, it is not totally smokeless, but I have not had incidents with neighbors complaining or having uh, uh, the fire department show up or things like that. I'm not recommending that people in residential areas do it, but for development purposes, it's been pretty uh, essential to, to, to be able to have something close to home. That was the midi size. Going to the medium size ones, uh, these are uh, four pictures from the one unit of this size that's been built. It's a four foot diameter and five foot long. It's out in California. Uh, uh, Thor Bailey, who is also attending this session, is the uh, uh, becoming the sort of, let's call it custodian or the caretaker of this unit that's out there. I live in Illinois. We built it in California. We test fired it at a uh, conference that was, that was out there in uh, the end of, the very end of February. And uh, uh, we'll have some few more comments about this particular unit, but you'll notice the, the different parts and stuff.
The uh, large size is one, none have been built yet. Uh, the picture on the lower left is, I think it's a 12 or uh, uh, 10 or 12 foot diameter steel culvert. And uh, they build them up to 18 foot uh, diameters of very strong steel, something that we would like to be able to do. And uh, this is reminiscent of what you would have with the uh, air burner and the ROI carbonator, uh, where you're feeding these uh, units of this size with uh, uh, tractors, with uh, grapple hooks and things. The picture on the right is with uh, 16, 116 scale models. And uh, when they're this size, you have to be doing something with regard to getting the amount of fuel into them. And this is not something that I can do in my backyard or on my own budget. So I'm actually actively looking for people who are saying, let's go to a larger size. I give all my assistance with regard to making this happen. And that refers to any place in the world. Okay, the ROCC kilns have four major components and then numerous auxiliary components, which I'll illustrate in, in here. The cylindrical pyrolyzer with its portal, a, a rack onto which that pyrolyzer sits and it rotates with either an axle or with wheels, a frame for the hood of chimneys. And I'm noting that the rack and frame can actually be combined in some units. And then we have the hood and chimneys, which as I pointed out, are separate from the pyrolyzer itself and uh, um, take the emissions away. Auxiliary components, including the loading shelf and the discharge slide, and then other things we have mechanization, instrumentation, handles, mixers, prongs, fingers, air control, insulation, heat extraction, and more things. Uh, the, the more I work with this, the more I find that uh, little extra things come on so, and are possible. Uh, the, of the four components, the cylindrical pyrolyzer, a uh, 55 gallon barrel on the left, uh, an anhydrous ammonia tank uh, is shown in the upper right. Current efforts, I have started the work to use half of that tank. It's a four foot diameter and 15 foot long. So I'm going to uh, two seven inch, uh, seven foot segments by cutting it in the middle. And then I just have to close off one end of it. Ready to go with this where uh, this is getting prices on and things like that for doing things. Corrugated steel pipe. And the picture on the lower right shows you the prongs which are in there to keep that uh, opening, to keep that portal closed or partially closed. And those prongs rotate out of the way for their, for when they're in, in use. So that, that's into the pyrolyzing uh, cylinder. The rack for the pyrolyzer, variety of different types and shapes and things. Uh, the simple one that was built in Kenya, is I, I, the only thing I brought over to Kenya were these four caster wheels and they were put together. The lower picture on the left is the uh, it's in my, the one in my backyard. And these are cross members of, uh, of shelving conduit heavy, pretty good, good stuff there. The wheels come from the uh, uh, local hardware store. The barrel is a 55 gallon drum, which I modified and, and did it all myself. Uh, the, on the right hand side without a picture is what I'm calling the eye rack. It's built with eye beams and uh, extended out the bases and top on it. And the uh, gives strength, great strength. You can pick it up with a forklift and stuff. That's what's going into the unit that's being built with that anhydrous ammonia tank, half tank there. The, the frame uh, that's going to hold up the hood, uh, on the left is the simple one from, um, uh, did I say Malawi, I, I'm in Kenya, okay? Uh, the X frame is shown there in the in the middle, and it holds it up. And the the uh, the hood actually slides on the frame. It is not built and fixed attached to that frame because there's advantages to moving it. And then that I frame again, uh, which would be for both holding up the the um, cylinder 
and also for holding up the hood and chimney. Hood and chimneys, uh, a flat one, uh, the one in India with um, uh, Manish is just a simple flat sheet of corrugated roofing metal that was torn off of one of their buildings during a cyclone that went through a few months earlier. I mean, we build stuff out of scrap. We build stuff out of what's called obtainium. You find it, we use it. The, um, the two on the lower left are uh, the unit in Kenya, and, the, and it slides back and forth. It slides over the top of the frame. And the uh, ones on the right-hand side, this is out in the California unit, and here the hood slides inside of the frame and has its advantages. And the hose coming up to it is to illustrate that by using forced air, you can have an induction that's going to give you the draft by induction. And you can direct the heat that is coming out from this hood horizontally and then anywhere, anywhere down and around and up and down uh, into there. We want to be able to utilize that heat because it's considered to be uh, of value to us. By the way, there is a uh, video that will be out, uh, that is out already to, as of today, that I'll give you an address on that will be able to show you some things out of this unit there in California functioning. The unit in India, um, the picture here helps define that on the left-hand side, which is called, which is, the, and it, is the, it is the front because the hood and the uh, uh, loading shelf are on that side. It is not on the, that because it's left or right. It is defined by the position of the hood and the loading shelf. And therefore, on the rear or back side, we have the discharge slide or the collection box as it comes out. Now, imagine that this unit, well, don't imagine it does, it rotates, it turns, turning the handle on there, and the portal can be into any of basic, six basic uh, positions or movements. Again, the front is to the left, uh, and left in this picture, uh, depends on which side of the unit you're standing on, but it, the front is where the loading shelf would be at, and the, and the back side is where the discharge takes place. The part A looks like the, uh, a backward letter C, that is the normal operating position where the um, uh, fuel goes in over that lower lip of the opening and the gases and, and uh, emissions come out through the, uh, uh, just underneath the top of that opening that's there. Uh, the position B is if you rotate the kiln so that the portal is straight up. There is, this is denying entrance of oxygen except for the minimum amount in it. This helps to control the fire, to tone it down. If you leave it in that way, you know, and this can still be under the hood and operating this way, but this is where if you're trying to do a slower element on your pyrolysis, you do have to, uh, with sensors or watching it so that you, it is possible to totally extinguish the flame in there because you're not getting any oxygen and it will, it will uh, not exactly snuff out easily, but it, it will, it's there, it will end. The one on the right, uh, which looks like the letter, normal letter C, this is the back side, and it can be then uh, in that particular position without the hood over how you can actually bulk load this cylinder, uh, the pyrolyzer, uh, without obstructions of the hood and or with uh, other mechanisms on it. The, the slide uh, for sliding in the fuel is on the left, uh, is on the front side, and the opening is to the right side. When you turn it straight down, D, and it's conveniently D for dump or down, this is how you're removing the char, and it just falls out very nicely into whatever container or sliding slope or something that, would, that you have arranged for it. E represents the rocking of the, uh, of the cylinder back and forth slowly or with quick movements if you'd, if you'd like. Uh, oh, like uh, more than 180 degrees are possible in there without spilling the char out of the unit. And then you can do a complete uh, rotation, a full rotation on it, mixing extensively, like if you have the prongs in there 
and then we, uh, this would be only in, uh, you know, conditional situations that it, it can be done that way. Okay. All these things have come out of our experience with the kiln. Uh, this is just to point out the wide variety of biomass types and shapes that we could use into there. I know I put down that sawdust is problematic. It would cake up and stuff like that. It is not something that I'm uh, particularly uh, fond of doing, as are also mulch and wood chips. Uh, they are, they could tend to accumulate and, and, and bury each other and, and insulate and keep the, the heat from getting to there. However, for the easy ones, things of stems and reeds, brush and small branches, anything that you can push in through that portal doorway manually or with, a, with an apparatus that's taking it in. Um, arm size branches are, uh, will pyrolyze very nicely. I've noticed that a four inch, uh, a, a four by four piece of, of timber will be uh, completely pyrolyzed in about an hour and a half inside of the kilns, which are in that those uh, midi range, the, the, the smaller size stuff. Cordwood, slab wood, this is excellent material that comes off of sawmills. It is monster supplies of this long, can fit into through that portal. We simply make the uh, rock kiln not five feet long, but we make it eight feet, we make it 12 feet. If you want to put it in, you could have a 20 foot long thing if you have 18 foot lengths of something that you wanted to put in and they would just feed them in if you have that feeding into that. And then we rotate it inside. Whole trunks, uh, you'll need time for pyrolysis there. Maybe even handling root balls with dirt on it makes no difference in this pyrolyzer. The dirt will be left in, mixed in with the char. If you're trying to make biochar that's supposed to go to, to roots, uh, to, into the soil anyway. So the ability to handle so many different forms of biomass can mean substantial savings on current pre-processing of biomass that needs to be disposed. The, yes, people are grinding and chipping things in part because that's how they can handle it these days. But if you can avoid the cost of grinding and chipping and take this stuff directly in, you'll be able to feed the ROCC kiln and get the results that you want. I made a table of the sizes of the kilns and I'm revising it, but I didn't, I wanted to leave it available as a sort of a reference document into there. Uh, we're not going to try to read the details of this thing here, but it, it is in the manual, which is on the internet, And but noting that it's being superseded even as we speak. I have extracted from that uh, something more selective, uh, 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 selective sizes of ROCC char makers. Uh, column B in the MIDI scale, that would be the barrel. Columns D and E in the medium size are the utilities of some sizes into there, four foot diameter, six foot could be a, a little bit larger than that. The, um, uh, the large scale units would be six foot, eight foot, 12 foot diameters uh, that we could have. Oh, I didn't mention on the other slide, a large size for a large scale container could be a railway tank car. Now, this is getting to be pretty serious with regard to the amount of biomass that you need in order to fill this in. But those railway tank cars are being replaced throughout uh, North America because of safety requirements. They're going to double walled and other types of things. And they are literally available at scrap prices. I'm hoping that somebody either listening here or will be mentioning to somebody who knows somebody who says, I'm willing to have a go with something will build up to those large sizes. Uh, that those are 10 foot diameter by uh, like 50 feet long, but we can also do the larger diameters and keep them shorter. It is what we need and how we want to do this. Uh, the, uh, the, the volumes are given there. The fuel input is in kilograms per hour and then putting in some more stuff like that. You notice that in uh, column G, the large scale, this is a, uh, no, I'm sorry, column E, uh, this is the four foot and eight foot length is like that anhydrous ammonia, half 
half tank that I was looking at doing. And it would take about five tons of, bio, of, of biomass import per workday. Again, it varies from type to type, thicknesses and stuff like that. Char output, I do my calculations based on about a 20% char yield. We are with flaming uh, activity in the area. We are not, it's, we, I mean, what we do not do 350 degree pyrolysis. I mean, it is not our, our nature to, to do that uh, in, in these uh, uh, covered cavity kilns. So uh, the thermal output is calculated down there. I'd like to point out that all of these numbers are extrapolations off of what we've done with a barrel. And they are not, therefore, totally accurate. We have to show it to be done. Uh, I'm reading in column A, uh, row three, extrapolation in there. Based on volume, there is less if based on the horizontal area of the flame cap pyrolysis. But when I'm looking at the, the numbers in here, how much uh, energy we could get out of it. If the numbers are wrong in for column E as to how we can get 2.8 million BTUs per hour coming out of this char maker, those numbers could be very appropriate for column G or for column uh, I or for other sizes in there. We are able to get a million BTUs per hour. We are, or we can go to 5 million BTUs per hour. And they, it's what we're after. Are we after heat? Are we after char? We're after both. What's the rush? We're just trying to get through all of the, um, get through that biomass because it's a safety hazard. Okay, that's a different one of those four reasons why we do pyrolysis. So, uh, none of these are specified. They will all be or be, or, or predetermined. All of them will be arranged as we relate to the particular needs of the people who want to do pyrolysis, who have the biomass, et cetera. There we, there we go. Uh, I didn't get very far on a hypothetical scenario for, utilize, for a utility-sized uh, rock kiln but abundant biomass of slabs or urban wood waste. Uh, um, uh, Michael Schaefer has interests in Thailand on how to do it of the, the uh, uh, straw and uh, field stubble that they have so that they don't have the air pollution. Michael spoke two weeks ago to this group, gave an excellent presentation about the, the issues there and the need for pyrolysis to be able to handle in fairly big volumes. Uh, that is a special topic of interest. Uh, I'm working on it with Michael. We have a design for uh, a unit to be built. Of course, the coronavirus is causing shutdowns for everybody everywhere. So um, if that is of interest to some people, please let me know. Please be in touch with me. Uh, the need for heat and hot water, an apartment complex, a school, a small industry. What size of char maker do you want to have? We want the heat. And we don't want to burn it all the way to ash. We get the valuable char and we get the, the carbon sequestration value of this. Uh, we are able to replace fossil fuels, avoiding the, the carbon tax that should be on fossil fuel. And maybe we can even get some of that money paid uh, to the, for the biochar that is produced. Biochar for agriculture is increasing value as, it, as we move along. Carbon sequestration increasing importance. And, uh, and I think that we should not be thinking in terms of uh, one year, three year uh, scenarios, but uh, uh, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, the situation is gonna be so much different and so drastic that this is going to be a, a major con uh, concern for us and the carbon sequestration value. Uh, the ROCC kiln invention is a pat has patent pending uh, status. Uh, we expect coverage until the year 2040. This protects uh, my interest, but it also protects your interest because I'm hoping you'll become involved and interested in this in, this in some ways. This is the discussion of the in investors. Oh, they've got to have 
patent protection or something, uh, intellectual property rights. We've got it and uh, being processed through all for international, at the international level. Um, um, but only when there is financial gain based off of this pyrolyzer, then some small share should come to the inventor. In other words, item three, there are no upfront fees to become involved with the ROCC kiln. Um, and you, uh, you get my uh, advice and, and assistance uh, uh, basically for free. I, I can't uh, travel around the world for you, but uh, for free, but I'm helping you with all the different things about it. And uh, uh, you can make a unit and do it. This is for your own personal use, that, that's fine. Um, but when somebody is making money off of the ROCC technology, then uh, I will be uh, talking with them and something reasonable. That's the way we can help finance and move, move things all forward. And therefore, with regard to all of you, all options are open for business arrangements. If you are interested in making devices, selling devices, you know, using them to make the char that you would do in the quantities that you need for your purposes, you want them for energy, you want them for climate benefits or more, all of those things are available and, and open. I don't make a big deal out of this, but I'm 76 years old. I'm in excellent health. I expect to be around for the 20 years of the patent. However, I'm not doing things on on my own. I am looking for people who wish to be involved with this, want to be involved with it. You, in your geographic area, in your field of activities, could benefit from the ROCC kiln. There's going to be some grants and things done. I'd like to be included in them, and I bring the, the kiln along with, I mean, the, the technology for it, so we can make the bigger ones. The Forestry Service should have something. The uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture interested in this. Well, how can we make charcoal in that me median um, uh, gap of where we don't have the, the pyrolyzers like that. And of course, then we have to look at what's the price of these units, okay? Next slide here. The barrel size unit, three, about three foot diameter, four foot long, something like that. Do it yourself for your own. It is essentially free. Use your own scrap, find your stuff, find your materials. I will advise you, I, this is why I'm sharing everything so freely out with the, uh, on my website and uh, by, via this webinar and also with the, um, uh, uh, with, with the other videos and things which are, are available. If you're going to purchase a ready-made, then somebody is out there supplying this. I'm willing to work with somebody who wants to be a supplier of the particular types of materials and devices. To make an arrangement with them, uh, an offer they can't refuse. I mean, something will be good. Uh, the I would point out that for the barrel size unit, a less expensive variation, not to be disclosed here yet, uh, should be available uh, a little over a month from now, and I'll I'll have that announced. Something I think you'll find it interesting. It's on the barrel size. Utility size, sort of the three foot to five foot diameters, up to ten feet long. Uh, there, the costs are between five and ten thousand uh, dollars. Somebody's going to have to make it. I mean, this is a uh, uh, the, the, buy these tanks, buy the equipment. There's welding. There's uh, work with that. I will assist you to help you locate a supplier or work with you on it. We have efforts to have a bit, uh, the ability to make the units here in Central Illinois. Also with Thor for prospects for making units out on the West Coast, out in the uh, Northern California area, and uh, wherever else there might be the cases. Certainly overseas, I'm looking for arrangements with individual, for people in different countries. And I'm not going to be there. If you're waiting for me, uh, you're going to wait a long time. I and mean, I want to help you, and I need to work with people. Um, and special arrangements for making units with features not previously included for heat and uh, heat capture and use. People who are in the business of furnaces and heating buildings and stuff like that, this unit is providing a source of heat. Everything else that they sell, the boiler, the tubing, the pumps and all that type of stuff, that's not my business. That is something that they do and they do it well. 
and I am looking at helping them to have an alternative source of abundant heat uh, and uh, in the process we'll be able to get the char from it and the, car the, the, ener the energy value but also the climate value. So for bulk size units, uh, these bigger ones, uh, just get in touch with me. I'm certainly interested in talking with possible joint uh, research efforts, business efforts, etc. The for climate intervention strategies, there's this four ways of making it values into their abundant biomass, many benefits, decentralized, because the biomass is decentralized. Decentralized biochar production is a highly appropriate, accessible, and reasonably priced major climate tool for carbon dioxide removal. I make that as a blanket statement, looking forward to somebody challenging me to say, hey, let's make that happen. I want to do that. Major accomplishments come from many, many small individual efforts, each making small contributions, and we can end up with uh, gigatons of uh, carbon sequestration coming through from that. And this is all becoming available. Notice the world needs things and uh, for energy, agriculture, biomass removal, sequestration. It is possible now with these medium-sized appropriate technologies. The um, uh, accessible the technology is willingly shared. If you're interested in this, I will get into the details, into the weeds of how to make something happen. Opportunities of ownership and rewards for the potentially profitable activities or for your research activities and things like that in your local areas and regional areas. I will try to coordinate the exchange of the information so something that's developed up in New Zealand becomes available to people who are trying to do it in Alaska versus people who are in Europe or Africa, et cetera. And so I say, why not, including in here, if or when there is another technology that can fill the gap for medium-sized pyrolysis units as well as or better than the rock kiln, we should all endorse it, and I will also. But while you're seeking or waiting, the rock kiln technology is available for your consideration. I'm making it available, and then it will become something for you people to do. Summary is, uh, it fills the gap, it makes the char, many different places and uses, possible scales, very large sizes, uh, resources at the, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this web, to this screen so you can see it afterwards here and copy it down. Woodgas.com is my website for the um, uh, wood gas pyrolytics company that I have, I've, that I've set up for it. The, uh, and the, the resources page, there's many different things, including the manual and also the video is available at that, at, at that place. It's a four minute video. I thank Rocky Thompson, who is also on this uh, presentation on this uh, uh, webinar, at this webinar. He's helped greatly in preparing up uh, a copy of uh, this, this YouTube. They'll show you in, in operation, doing things like that. It's an introductory piece. Direct access to me for whatever you're looking for. There's my email address, which is widely distributed. Demonstrations, I hope that they'll be possible out in California with Thor and in India with Manish and in Pennsylvania with Gary and in Illinois with me and we'll find other places that are going along with it. And final one is my contact information. Again, if you get to woodgas.com, uh, which is the old website of the Biomass Energy Foundation from Tom Reed, which I have uh, uh, sort of inherited on it. So uh, we can work on it with that there. And I would point out that I'm not going to show them, but there's four extra slides to help visualize the volume and the energy associated with one ton of biomass, five tons of biomass. Just quick things like that. If people wanted to, to look at that, that's just attached on at the end of it. So there's the, the slide that I'll finish with there. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that it's uh, gobbled up most of the time for the for any questions. I can stick around, but uh, I, I don't know about you. Sorry, I uh, hope you found it interesting. Thank you. Uh, at this particular scale, this, you're, this is really the grassroots uh, uh, moment for this, for this technology, and I thank the um, uh, Christian and, and the Green Carbon uh, webinar series for giving me this opportunity to uh, 
to express it, to, to see it, to get some exposure on it. 